Test one, two. Check, check, one, two. If everybody could grab a seat. This is, this is a remarkable turnout. Look at all of you. Thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Chris Hall. I'm the CEO of the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I just want to welcome you all here this morning and thank you for taking some time. Um, uh, I was very uh, pleased when NRCM reached out to the chamber to ask us to co-host this event. And, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, I have worked personally in, uh, in the field of environmental policy for the business community. This seemed like a great opportunity to show uh, everyone, because everyone is going to hear about this, uh, that uh, our environmental community and our business community uh, share uh, similar opinions on this topic and can come together and have a conversation about it and hopefully move the agenda forward both here in Maine and, and at the national level as well. So your presence here today is greatly appreciated. I want to thank you all. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Lisa Pullman, the Executive Director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine. We are very pleased to gather you all together at the end of what is an historic week. On Monday, the Obama administration announced that they were taking the single biggest step to address climate change to date. Finally, our federal government will be setting limits on the amount of carbon dioxide that the nation's power plants can put into the air. Power plants are the largest single source of carbon pollution. They have been emitting carbon unabated for over a century, and that is contributing to climate change. Finally, as a nation, we are recognizing that climate change is real, carbon pollution is helping to drive it, and it's harming our environment, our health, and our future. So this week we also learned that Maine and Vermont are warming faster than all other states. That's because the Arctic Sea is melting and that is changing the temperature of the airflow coming our way. So this warming is harming our nature-based industries like fisheries, it's creating more severe weather events that get in the way of doing business like destroying coastal properties, closing bridges, warping train tracks, it's increasing health risks like Lyme disease and asthma, and it's putting our treasured wildlife at risk like brook trout and moose. So we have a moral obligation to our kids and our grandkids to move in a different direction so that the Maine we love is there for them. We need to shift how we produce energy and learn to use it more efficiently. And big shifts like this are tough, but we've already started in Maine. We know that we can work together to solve environmental and economic problems as big as climate change. We know that cleaner energy creates business opportunities for Maine. We were the first state in the nation to create a climate action plan. We are one of nine northeastern states to already put limits on carbon pollution from our region's power plants, and we started back in 2009 with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. And you're going to hear that Reggie has been a win-win all along. This is a big deal. You know, I, I'm convinced that one of the problems that we have around here, not in Maine, but just generally, is we don't celebrate enough. You know, we're very good at identifying the problems, and there are a hell of a lot of problems. And, you know, I work in the U.S. Senate. I mean, that's a problem right there. Uh, but these rules that were announced this week are a huge step forward for the country. Most significant. Uh, acknowledgement and, and doing something about uh, the issue of, of climate change and, uh, and fossil fuel use and uh, the environment and the, uh, the air uh, in, in as long as I can remember, really. Uh, and it was really fun. I was, I, I was doing a little research last night and uh, found a great quote. It said, these rules will bring an end to the automobile industry. Did you already tell them this? <coughs> These, this is almost an exact quote. Automobile production will end in the United States because of this rule. That was Lee Iacocca in 1971 when the Clean Air Act was passed. And there, you can go back and read all of these quotes from everybody who said, and I remember, I said, you know, one of my disadvantages is I'm old enough to remember those days and remember the 
total gloom and doom of, uh, you know, it, it's going to cost, I mean, it's almost exactly what's being said today. It's going to cost thousands of jobs. It's going to close down. Our, it's gonna, we're not going to be able to compete. It's, you know, it's impossible. Well, I'll tell you one, this is a great story about impossibility. As some of you may know, uh, uh, Chris didn't give me a long introduction. Sometimes people go through my whole resume and, and I get up to the podium and I, the only thing I can think is, this guy can't hold a job. Because I've had, the, my eight years as governor is the longest I've ever hold, held one job in my life. Uh, but one of my jobs was as being the lobbyist for the environmental community in the 70s. One of the things that was accomplished during that period was the bottle bill, okay? We passed the bottle bill. Now, many, of, most of you in this audience will not remember this, but when, when uh, self-opening cans were first uh, on the market, you had this circle that you pulled, and the thing came out, and it was like a razor blade. In fact, it's been immortalized in Jimmy, by Jimmy Buffett in Margaritaville, where he talks about, uh, blew out my flip-flop, stepped on a pop-top. That, the, for those young people, I'm gonna, now going to tell you what that line means. <laughs> but you'd pull this thing out, it was sharp as hell, and, you know, it would get dropped, and it was, it was bad for the environment, it was downright dangerous, and, I, and part of the bottle bill banned those things and said, you can't, you've got, they've got to, it's got to stay attached to the can. And I remember vividly being on the third floor of the State House and having a lobbyist for the bottle industry who shall remain nameless, Severin Beliveau. <laughs> uh, Severin came up to me and he was very serious. You know how Severin can be. He was very serious and, and said, said, you know, Angus, we've, we've, we've really worked on this and our engineers have worked on it. We've had MIT look at it. It's impossible <laughs> to make a pop top that doesn't remove. It's impossible. Well, here we are. I mean, the point is, and that's what's, the, the, to me, that's what's the best thing about what the EPA did, is they allowed the states and industry to have the creativity and the ingenuity to figure out how to get where we want to get. To me, that's the proper role for regulation, not for the EPA to say, you've got to put a, a, a scrubber number XYZ 42, you know, 46 feet in the, in the pipe. No, here's what we can tolerate out of the pipe. You figure out how to do it. And that allows the market to work. It allows uh, ingenuity and creativity to work. And you end up with solutions that you didn't, you didn't really think of, like uh, dealing with uh, uh, cow farts in, uh, in Wisconsin. Could I, did I just say that? Uh, but I, I really, I, I, I'm, this is a serious point. This is the way we should be regulating, in my view. Um, Reggie, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is a very informed crowd, but for anyone who was grabbed off the street and said, come on in, hear about market-based greenhouse gas control programs, and actually came in. <laughs> the, the greenhouse gas program that we have is nine northeastern and mid-Atlantic states, um, Maryland and Delaware up to Maine. We bound it together, actually starting in 2005, letter from Governor Pataki, then Governor of New York, set it off. Majority of Republican governors just at that time decided to move forward, along with Governor Baldacci in Maine, to set up the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. On that bipartisan point, I want to note my fellow Reggie director, Patty Ajo, is not here, um, nor um, is Governor LePage, obviously. But if you talk to them, whatever you might have to say to them, I would note a note of appreciation for staying in Reggie and strengthening Reggie. The bipartisan consensus in Maine um, on Reggie has continued. So the way that we run um, is that we auction off carbon allowances every quarter. We just finished our 24th auction and just announced $5.02 was a clearing price a few minutes ago. So 24 successful auctions, very successful market. Our market monitor has never detected any evidence of market manipulation or of the market working incorrectly. Now that said, um, one commodity analyst said, not the most exciting market, um, which is fine with us. We're not out to create excitement for commodity traders. Okay, enough said. On to the next slide. Um, this is NRCM's slide because it was better than my slide, so I borrowed it. I have a couple of their slides. What this shows is overall greenhouse gas emissions for the state of Maine and overall economic growth. Similar structure for all of the Reggie states. 
If you look at our economy, there's actually an article out today that looked at our economies. They concluded that our economic growth is stronger in the Reggie states than it is in the other states. And whether that exact analysis is entirely accurate or not, the point is, by designing smart programs, working with the business community, working with utilities and the power sector, we've designed smart programs that have decoupled any economic regulation from the cost of pollution reduction. Um, and that's important. It's important to continue to do that and work with our business leaders, our regulators, to continue that trend. Next slide. Independent review was undertaken of just our first three years of operation. An expert group um, out of Boston called the Analysis Group was retained, um, set up a bipartisan um, group to oversee it, look at the study design. Some of the utilities were represented. We were not represented. They, um, they kept it away from us, which was frustrating at the time, um, until we saw the results. The results came out and said that just from the first three years of operation for how we dedicated our allowances, I um, mean, this is on the economics, not on the pollution reduction. Just the first three years of operation, they expected over the life of all those measures to create a net economic benefit for our Reggie states of $1.6 billion and over 16,000 jobs. Um, so it works economically um, as well as as an effective pollution reduction program. Next slide. Um, overall costs, by the way, if I mentioned, if you just look at costs isolated from those benefits that I cited, um, the costs are a little bit less than 1%, maybe half a percent on average across all of our states. So there is a cost, but if you design the program well um, and moving forward, you can design the program so that your benefits will vastly exceed the cost. So how do we do that? Well, in New England, we've dedicated the largest percentage of all the Reggie states to energy efficiency. And in Maine, we just did not just that, but through the Efficiency Maine Trust, the director, Michael Stoddard, is here who does the hard work in figuring out what programs to fund and what individual projects to allocate these monies to. Overall, about 40% of these revenues have gone to large-scale industrial and commercial projects. Why? That's where we can get the biggest bang for our buck in pollution reduction, in energy savings, and in reducing the bottom line for businesses to compete in the global marketplace to sell the products here in Maine. We're reducing their bottom line energy costs. Very important. Second largest share to the commercial um, energy projects overall. So about 70% of our proceeds are going to reduce bottom line expenditures for main businesses. And what does that do? Well, it reduces, obviously, their expenditures. It also creates macroeconomic benefits for the economy overall. So you get a double economic benefit. You're reducing the cost of doing business, you're keeping money in the region, and you're stopping the outflow of resources from the region to purchase fossil fuels that we don't produce in most of our states in the region. Um, and then residential programs, 26%. So that's how we've allocated our revenues and how we make Reggie work. These are overall benefits. Again, this is um, from, the, from the NRCM who took a look at this most recently. If just the first five years of operation, about $31 million funded through the Efficiency Main Trust, creating almost nine times that economic benefit over the lifetime of the measures. So that's sort of Reggie and how it's been working. Next slide. We evaluated, so it's a proven model. I mean, this is the argument we made to EPA. It's cost effective for reducing greenhouse gases. It's actually economically beneficial for our region. Um, it recognizes the regional nature of the electricity grid. Electricity flows all over New England and between the Northeast. Um, and it's very easy to keep track of greenhouse gases because we measure them when they come out of the stack. Um, so those are the arguments we made to EPA to allow Reggie to continue as a compliance method. We appreciate the fact that EPA has allowed that in the rules, so thank you. Um, and we're still looking at the details of that. Okay. Um, it works so well, together with a lot of other measures, as well as straight market responses to the price of natural gas, that our cap that we set initially was a lot higher than actual emissions were. Emissions are down over 40% in the Reggie region since 2005 already. So we've achieved, through a variety of measures, over 40% reductions. Because of that, we looked at the cap and said, the cap really isn't much of a cap anymore. So we, all nine states, um, all the governors, the legislatures, um, main legislature, decided to reduce the cap, to bring the cap down to current emissions. So we reduced the cap to half of what our emissions were in 2005. Going forward, this revision will not only reduce additional greenhouse gases, but it'll enhance those economic benefits that I talked about before. Our modeling shows that we'll get about $8 billion in gross domestic product for those states to be increased and generate over 124,000 job years. Now, an economist, I respect um, 
Dr. Colgan's opinion, those, if you look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, they may be negligible, but it's a lot better that those gains are positive than negative, is all you can say as a regulator. Okay, next slide. Um, because we work so extensively within the region and within Maine with our business community and the affected um, companies, um, when it came time to make comments to EPA, our region operated very differently than the other regions. Utilities in the rest of the country um, submitted comments to EPA that may not have been all that supportive of moving forward. We had a lot of our utilities and power sector and environmental groups submit joint comments asking that REGI be allowed to be the compliance um, mechanism for our region. And again, EPA is allowed for that, which we appreciate.